Good morning, US. Thank you to, to have come to participate to our third webinar on sustainability. Uh, Bulgari has organized this uh, webinar on innovation, the present for a sustainable future. Today, I'm pleased and the honor to, to host our um, CEO, Jean-Christophe Babin, together with Dr. Lifton. I will introduce you later, uh, singularly. And um, Mrs. Yanti Surikto. I personally am the Director of Sustainability in Bulgaria, and I'm pleased to moderate this session. I'm very proud to do this. So thank you in advance for everybody who is coming and listening to us. So uh, let's start with Yanti, Yanti Surikto. Uh, she is the President and Chief uh, Executive Officer in Save the Children, uh, starting January 2020. I'm very pleased to introduce her. She is one, uh, the one who has, um, in fact, built her career long in the, in the Save the Children Association and did so many projects. And so she is with us to introduce uh, our specific uh, initiatives uh, with them. And I uh, also have honor to uh, introduce Dr. Lifton, uh, the actual president, the 11th, let's say, president of the Rockefeller University. As you know, he, he is a well-known physician scientist. And I thank particularly Dr. Lifton to uh, come here. Um, and uh, he is the one who has pioneered the use of genetics and um, genomics to understand the fundamental mechanism of our, uh, in fact, human diseases, and normally human diseases. So thank you. And Jean-Christophe Babin, welcome to our CEO. And he, he, he has a very long story in uh, managing uh, enterprises, starting from uh, uh, the uh, um, experience in Ankle coming back to Takoyer in, in 2000. In very few years, he has to put it in the success positioning, positioning that they, they, this brand in a very high position. And then finally, he has come to Bulgaria and I have the, um, the, 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 the I'm very proud because I start my activities in, Bulg in Bulgaria together with him. And um, uh, since this uh, experience, we are doing projects in sustainability. And today we are talking specifically on three topics. The first is concerning link to our uh, COVID period. So the, how our company is facing the virus. And so I think that we will talk about very specifically on this relationship between us and the Rockefeller University. And second, uh, how our company is facing also the, um, the team of heritage, restoration, the work in Rome. So how is positioning our brand to, uh, facing the historical matters of, uh, of the towns? And third, so last but not least, um, some topics regarding our relationship, our partnership with uh, Save the Children in the field of uh, children uh, and the launch of a project specifically in California. So thank you very much again. I will stop myself. I will uh, immediately pass to the first um, questions introducing the, um, this specific theme of, uh, of the virus. And so the science, Cesar and science. So we did projects since the beginning. We, Bulgaria has been pioneer in, in funding, for instance, Spallanzani Rome, um, also the Oxford University. But now I would like that Jean-Christophe uh, uh, together with Dr. Lifton, talk a little bit about this wonderful initiative. Thank you. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending that webinar. Obviously, a warm uh, thank to uh, Richard and the Rockefeller University, because without you, we wouldn't be uh, here today. And thanks, Eleanor, for that uh, short introduction. So I'm Jean-Christophe. I'm the CEO of uh, Bulgari, uh, the famous uh, Roman hydroelectric. And uh, just some background, perhaps, which is interesting, that Bulgari has ever engaged uh, in uh, corporate social responsibility initiatives well before the CSR name was even invented. It was a long generosity tradition of the founding Bulgarian family a family which is still in the board of the company. So this uh, dimension you know, of generosity of humanity remains very prevalent, even though uh, now the company is part of the LVMH uh, luxury group. And uh, in terms of uh, corporate social responsibility, the company has built 
on three dimensions. One is the artistic dimension. We have been ever inspired by Roma on Alif City. And uh, since decades, we are paying a tribute to, to that city, uh, founding and financing some uh, restoration initiatives uh, among the Spanish steps, uh, the Caracalla mosaics, and more recently we announced the Tolonia Marbles uh, exhibition. It's a unique exhibition, probably uh, the most incredible antique exhibition since Tutankhamon and uh, Largo Argentina, which is a place where uh, Emperor Cesar has been assassinated and which uh, we're going to open to the public. The second axis has been very much on uh, kids' education and there, uh, Yanti, thank you for trusting us as much as we've been trusting you. I mean, it's more than 10 years now that we are one of the main partners of Central Children uh, internationally. And uh, this has led to uh, supporting more than 2 million kids' education and many other initiatives we do not uh, discuss later. And the third uh, dimension has been else, uh, well before the COVID erupted, uh, partnering, for instance, a few years ago with the Elton John Heights Foundation, uh, which uh, this time was very important. And with the COVID uh, erupting in China first and then in, in Europe, uh, Bulgaria uh, first has decided to turn its perfume factory, which is south of Milan, into a sanitizing gel uh, facility. Why? Uh, just because those products, which are essential to protect the medical staff, the nurses, which were about 10% of casualties in Italy, so very, very high toll uh, on the, the scientific and the medical uh, corps, um, they were just missing of everything. Blouses, gloves, gels, name it. And so uh, Bulgari, being a major fragrance producer, we decided to stop producing fragrances to convert the production facility to scientific gel, which we donated massively, first to the Italian government, uh, second uh, to the Swiss government, and uh, last to the British government. So basically we have donated close to one million bottles, which have been uh, very helpful in the first weeks of, of the COVID uh, disaster to somehow protect and continue to protect those medical st uh, staff, which were very exposed. And then when uh, the supply has started to be better, I mean, from regular gel producers, we really wondered that Bulgaria whether we should stop or whether, conversely, it was not very important to, to continue. And very quickly, we, we decided to create a fund, something which was much more longer term than the jail initiative, a fund which would finance uh, the best searchers and the best students uh, into not only, I mean, uh, fighting COVID-19 from testing uh, to curing uh, and to obviously uh, preventing, but also longer term uh, to avoid that after the 19, uh, there might be a COVID-24 coming, or COVID-29, because we know that with humankind demographic growth, anything habits, uh, it's very likely to do that in the future for the uh, viruses will come. And this fund, which has been founded by, by Bulgari, is a multi-million uh, dollars fund, and it's basically, uh, financing three major institutes, Spallanzani in Rome, which has been a pioneering hospital in Ebola and AIDS research. Um, then uh, the Oxford University, as Eleanor mentioned, uh, which is quite advanced in the vaccination uh, COVID process. And last but not least, and I'm very happy today because we officially announced this amazing partnership with the Rockefeller University. I mean, a very pioneering advanced institute. And, uh, and Richard uh, is president, uh, which uh, obviously is worldwide famous, I mean, when it comes uh, to biomedical research. And uh, we believe that uh, there is a lot of complementarity eventually between the Spallanzan on one end, the Oxford on the other end, and uh, the Rockefeller, uh, which is a major uh, step uh, for us also because our Rockefeller is very much uh, led by ladies, uh, except you, Richard. And uh, at Bulgari, we've ever been promoting gender equality. And we are very happy also to collaborate with the university, which is not only, I mean, uh, over the top when it comes to uh, biomedical care, but also university, which uh, acknowledge, I mean, the talent and the power of women. Yeah, Dr. Lifton, specifically, can you please specify and talk about this uh, specific aspect of this 75 is a day women who are working in the COVID research um, laboratories. This is very, very interesting aspect that we would like to talk about. Sure. Well, thank you very much, uh, Eleonora and uh, Jean-Christophe. Thank you for your welcome and uh, kind introduction. It's been a real pleasure to make all of your acquaintance, and I've been so impressed with your leadership, vision, and humanitarian efforts during this challenging time for the world. 
On behalf of Rockefeller University, our board of trustees, and our renowned scientists, I'm absolutely delighted to thank Bulgari for your extraordinary generosity. Your support will establish the Bulgari Women in Science Fund to accelerate COVID-19 research. This will create uh, nine Bulgari Women in Science fellowships. And these fellowships will support women graduate students and postdoctoral scholars in Rockefeller laboratories that are conducting COVID-19 research. The gift will also create the Bulgari Clinical Fund, which will provide early funding for the development of clinical testing of new therapies and drugs to combat COVID-19 and related coronaviruses. We at Rockefeller are great admirers of Bulgari for its commitment to corporate social responsibility. And I'm sure Bulgari's uh, remarkable ethical and, and social values impact the work and spirit that uh, goes throughout the organization, as does your dedication to environmental sustainability. So Rockefeller shares this commitment very strongly and we're honored and excited to be entering into this important new partnership with you. Together, we have the potential to benefit so many lives. As a Bulgari partner, Rockefeller is honored to be in the very good company of Save the Children. All of us at Rockefeller are deeply impressed by the work of Save the Children, and I'm delighted to be taking part in this webinar today uh, with uh, uh, Yanti Saripto, who is leading the organization in its invaluable work. In our earliest discussions with Bulgari, it became apparent that uh, our two organizations share similar values and priorities in our respective missions. Bulgari has a longstanding commitment to nurturing the careers of women in arts and culture. And similarly, Rockefeller has been a leader in supporting and promoting the careers of women scientists. In 1997, Rockefeller established the Women in Science program to serve as a source of support for women researchers at Rockefeller. This program has become a blueprint and a model for other scientific and medical institutions. Since the program's inception, supporters of women in science have funded more than 240 fellowships for women scientists, and these have been instrumental in recruiting women faculty to the university. Bulgari and Rockefeller were similarly united in our desire to immediately respond to the COVID-19 pandemic that has so impacted the entire world. Our partnership will bring together these priorities by funding women investigators working in the 25 Rockefeller laboratories that are directly working on COVID-19. More than 75 women in these laboratories are working to find solutions to this disease. Bulgari and Rockefeller are also truly international in our focus and reach. Nearly half of our scientists uh, were born outside the United States and are now conducting their research at Rockefeller. For those of you who uh, might not be familiar with Rockefeller University, please allow me a moment to, to share a little bit of background about Rockefeller. We're the world's premier biomedical research institution with a singular focus, science for the benefit of humanity. We were founded in 1901 by John D. Rockefeller, who realized at that time that the major limit to preventing or treating disease was a lack of fundamental understanding of their primary causes. And this has led to our credo, science for the benefit of humanity. Rockefeller is located on 16 beautiful acres on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. By design, we are a small institution with only about 70 faculty currently, but these 70 are world leaders in each of their fields. We have no departments. Each of our laboratories is led by a, a great scientist who reports directly to the president and who is recruited because of their unique vision to transform a field of biomedicine. By creating a small, highly interactive environment with great clarity of mission and focus, we direct all of our resources to do the most audacious science that has the greatest potential, impact, greatest potential for impact. And the results speak for themselves. Many of the most powerful discoveries of the last century of biomedicine have occurred at Rockefeller, including the discovery that DNA is the chemical of heredity, the cornerstone of the biomedical revolution that is occurring today. And the world has noticed among only 254 professors in our history, 25 have won the Nobel Prize in medicine or chemistry. To put that in perspective, if Rockefeller were a country, it would rank fourth in the number of Nobel Prizes won in these fields. And in the last 20 years, no other institution, regardless of size, has won as many Nobel Prizes in medicine as our faculty. Our small size is a great source of strength. It affords us the chance to recruit faculty based on their individual excellence, 
rather than their field of investigation. And this has permitted us to bring together an unparalleled group of audacious entrepreneurial scientists with the potential to transform our understanding of life, health, and disease. Our size also allows us to be very nimble, rapidly responding to both new opportunities and social needs. These qualities made it possible for us to move quickly when this deadly pandemic struck New York in March. While we shut down our campus for the safety of all, we maintained open the 25 laboratories that had immediately pivoted to launch vital research projects on COVID-19. Led by renowned Rockefeller scientists, these uh, laboratories have been working tirelessly from multiple angles to develop novel diagnostic, preventive, and therapeutic approaches to COVID-19. These experts encompass diverse fields, including infectious disease, virology, immunology, genomics, structural biology, and many others. And they're collaborating with colleagues from around the world to maximize the pace of discovery. One of the most promising of these projects comes from world-renowned immunologist Michelle Nussenzweig. Michelle has pioneered a method to isolate and clone broadly neutralizing antibodies from people who have successfully fought viral infections. Now Michelle's team has created an antibody therapy to treat and prevent COVID-19 that is entering clinical trials. Leading these clinical trials is physician scientist Marina Kasky, one of the outstanding women scientists here at Rockefeller working on COVID-19. Other promising projects include identifying novel reagents that can form the basis for a home diagnostic test for COVID-19, the discovery of gene mutations in, hu in the human genome that prevent viral infection, suggesting novel targets for therapy, and screening for drugs that can stop the virus in its tracks. On behalf of the Rockefeller community, I would like to once again thank the Bulgari Corporation of America for this wonderful gift and collaboration. Their, your visionary generosity is not only helping Rockefeller to address the global health crisis we now face, but is providing the foundation for future discoveries by generations of world-class women scientists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lifton. In few words, um, what is something you will always remember uh, in this period, in COVID-19 period, in terms of, uh, term of resiliency, something that you never, never forget? Yes, I think, uh, you know, there are many uh, very strong elements to the pandemic. You know, we're in uh, the midst, uh, middle of New York City, across the street uh, from one of New York's great hospitals, New York Presbyterian Hospital, and on the other side is uh, a great cancer hospital, Memorial Sloan Kettering. When the pandemic uh, uh, really descended upon us uh, like a bomb going off, I'm sure much like uh, in Northern Italy, uh, it, uh, it really turned the city upside down. And the part that I found most remarkably gratifying was the number of scientists at Rockefeller who immediately said, what can we do? We're, we're, we, this is not our native uh, focus but I'm sure we can put together programs that uh, have the potential to impact the virus. And the collective uh, response in the community, I think, has just been remarkable. I mentioned the project uh, by Michelle Nussenzweig's laboratory. Uh, well, that's an understatement. There, are, there were dozens of individuals in many different laboratories, including our research hospital, uh, that were involved in recruiting patients, bringing them into uh, the Rockefeller Hospital, uh, to give uh, blood samples that led to the uh, development of the antibodies that are now in use. And this uh, uh, collective, you know, we, we like to say at Rockefeller that everyone, because of our mission and uh, the unity of our mission, everybody's rowing in the same direction. And this project, I think, exemplified that uh, more than any other. Uh, everybody has just come together in a remarkable way uh, to move these projects forward on a timescale that uh, would not normally be imaginable. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Lifton. We come back to you for the Q&A because now we, we pass to, to another topic, but thank you very much for your contribution and for your um, thoughts. Sure. Laura, Laura, sorry to interrupt you, but I think yeah. that a couple of things that uh, still uh, I, I would like to, to address. I mean, we very briefly mentioned and Richard uh the, the impact i mean of, of women and de facto i mean this collaboration is really building on the bulgari women and science fund uh, to accelerate the covid 19 and there are i think two dimensions which i just wanted to to underline which are very important 
Uh, on the one hand, uh, we're going to, through that fund, uh, finance uh, a clinical fund for the development of clinical testing. You know that uh, when uh, you're developing new medicines, whether those are creative or preventive, obviously, a, a lot of time has to be dedicated to uh, the restriction of those medicines and to understand better, I mean, the side effects. So testing is foremost and testing uh, takes a lot of time, uh, costs a lot of money. So part of the funding uh, we, we're going to provide uh, to the Oracular University will go really uh, to further support, I mean, those ambitious testing programs. Uh, also because the Rockefeller is pretty keen and, and eager, I mean, to, to help mankind and humankind uh, to fight better uh, that, that terrible disease. And the second thing, which is very important and connects uh, pretty much with our uh, 11 years uh, commitment with uh, several children is uh, relative to, to younger people. I mean, um, not for testing, but for scholarships. Indeed, uh, with several children, we've been very much working together to promote education uh, and right after education also to provide some uh, skilled kids with a kind of toolbox for an early professional life. And here uh, with the Rockefeller, we're going one step further because uh, with Richard, we are very conscious that some very bright students and uh, often, I mean, potential Nobel Prizes just cannot make it uh, just because they don't have the financing backing uh, to go further uh, to their PhD or beyond the PhD. And therefore, part of the funding will go uh, to finance uh, the scholarships uh, through the Bulgari Women in Sciences Fellowship. Uh, just to support those brightest uh, ladies and women who are at the Rockefeller uh, to uh, further uh, study their postdoctoral programs and eventually to achieve their dream and vision uh, for the best of humankind. Because again, I mean, uh, research is really uh, something extremely uh, demanding, but at the same time very generous. And the path to research is a long one and a very costly one only. And uh, as uh, many of the bright students cannot necessarily afford it, uh, consistently with what we've been doing uh, since 11 years with several children, we decided that part of our funds should be dedicated uh, to scholarships, which is exactly the same thing we have done also with Oxford. So there will be uh, extraordinary students in Oxford, in the UK, and in Rockefeller, in New York, which will benefit from, uh, from that support, which I believe is extremely important. I mean, we should always, when we move on to those initiatives, think not only about, I mean, uh, the final result, but the longer term. And the longer term is obviously kids, young students, people with dreams, with visions, and that Burari will try to enable, I mean, uh, those visions to eventually concretize. Yeah, it's a very important. Thank you, Jean-Christophe. You underlined this fil rouge between the, uh, the donation and the, the fund that we are uh, built uh, in Bulgari, Bulgari company built. So you mentioned uh, now the most uh, important thing, one of the most important thing in which Bulgaria is acting, so the scholarship. So, if you agree, I uh, immediately asked to Yanti Suriptu to introduce the Save the Children uh, specific plan, specific project uh, launched in California. And uh, I think that can be explained also and complete uh, Bulgaria vision how Jean-Christophe Babant uh, explained very well in, in, uh, in, in, in facing the, the, uh, the children and the scholarship matters. Yanti Suriptu, can I ask you to, uh, to talk us some uh, specific uh, details of not only on another patronage, uh, but specifically in Arti di Bulgari, Arti of Bulgari, and this expansion in, in California. Sure, thank you, Eleonora, and thank you, thank Jean-Christophe, you. and great to be on this uh, panel also with uh, Dr. Lifton in, in em em eminent company here, um, and, and delighted to, to hear of con Bulgari's continued uh, commitment and, and investment behind, particularly uh, female leadership uh, and, to, and to hear about those fellowships. Um, last year in 2019, Bulgaria and Save the Children celebrated uh, 10 years of, of part of a global partnership that's had an enormous impact on, on children all over the world. We've, uh, Bulgaria raised over $100 million uh, through the sales of its, uh, I would say, iconic uh, jewelry, jewelry collection. Um, more than half a million people have purchased those pieces across the world and we've impacted uh, nearly 2 million children 
uh, across 35 countries over the past 10 years. And we're specifically looking, um, as Jean-Christophe just said, uh, on, on education. So I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the program in California. We're looking, we've been focusing on emergency response, working with refugee children, uh, and we've been working on um, youth empowerment. So particularly helping children develop skills uh, to, to help them uh, once, they, once they leave school and get into, in, into good employment or start their own, start their own company. Um, in the United States, um, I was really lucky in September last year, it's all, it looks really long ago, but it wasn't actually, when we launched the Arte de Bulgari program in Texas, um, in, 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 a, in, a, in a primary school, um, and we're about to launch that in a primary school. Um, What Arte di Bulgari does is um, really linking up the local community, so the schools, the parents, the children, with local artists, and it helps children explore their own creativity, and it gives them a real opportunity to engage with, with art. It, it gives them a proper arts curriculum uh, in their after-school program. And it was great to see that last year with a fantastic group of, of young children who were getting incredibly enthusiastic about the ability to to, to paint, to draw, to get help from local artists from their own community uh, that could also serve as a role model for them. Um, and it really takes a village in that sense to, to help these children deliver on their potential. Now, we're delighted that even in today's world under, under COVID, we'll be able to, to launch a program in California. We're launching it across 13 schools uh, in, in California. Um, we're hoping to engage, to enroll at least 500 children uh, and give them the opportunity to connect with local artists, to help their schools run these after-school programs specifically focused uh, on, on art. And in, and in the process, not only allow children to express their creativity, but it also helps them process um, all kinds of other experiences that, that they have in their lives. And arts, as, as we know in Save the Children for many, many years, helping children with arts helps them also process trauma or mental health issues um, in, in, the, in their lives. So I'm delighted that we'll be able to launch a second program after having some, some great results out of the first year in, in Texas of Arte de Bulgari. Wonderful, wonderful. And have you seen some artwork already done during the, the COVID period? Did you have the chance to, to monitor something that they have finished? <laughs> Well, of course, we, so we launched the... <laughs> well, I, I did like, I, when I was there in September, of course, we were still able to, to, to go there and do, and do the program in, in person. I was very in, impressed by the, by the rainbow fish uh, expressions of, of the children. Um, I, and of course, in, in, in March, when most schools uh, close, we've been able to continue some of the work remotely. So we've been helping children uh, with their arts uh, even though they had to do it at home, of course, they were then, um, you know, they were able to send in some of their artwork. They still were able to get some tutoring uh, virtually or sometimes over the phone because um, connectivity in rural America is also an issue. Uh, but I'm really pleased that we've been able to maintain the level of programming. And, and we were, because we were doing it virtually, we were even able in Texas to expand the reach of the program because we, we could now reach children even beyond those classrooms. Yeah, um, we know and we see that uh, a lot of uh, students uh, depend on uh, sometimes on school for healthy meals. It is a phenomenon we will see not only in US, I think in Europe, in Italy, it's a very important. And uh, um, is Save the Children also involved in this, in this field, supporting nutritional needs sometimes students? What, what is your opinion, uh, San Yanti? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very good point, Eleanor. In the United States alone, 33 million children rely on uh, schools yeah. for, their, for their meals, uh, for their nutritious meals a, a day. And, if, and as you say, that, that issue 
exists uh, outside of the United States. Um, so when schools closed in, in March, we immediately had to pivot because Save the Children wasn't involved in, in, in any of that. In the United States, of course, we do food security programs across the world. So I'm, I'm, I was very proud that we were able to to adapt and shift, and we were literally uh, delivering meals to children, to their to their communities, through by using the existing school buses, which of course weren't used to uh, weren't used to bring and children to their schools. But we now use them to drop off uh, learning materials, books, and meals to to children in their communities. Sometimes to their homes directly, sometimes to to churches and sports clubs where people could come and pick it up. Uh, since March, Save the Children has been delivering over 6 million meals to over 300,000 families in our rural communities, including in, in, in Texas, where, where we work together. Um, and it's been an incredible source of um, uh, comfort, I think, to, to many families who, who would otherwise be completely at a loss to, as to how to provide even just the simplest basic needs for their children. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Yanti, for this point. I would like to come back uh, to Dr. Lifton. Before to do that, I would like to remember all journalists that they, if they want, they might write since now they questions and we will be very happy to answer back at the end of our conversation. Thank you. So, Dr. Lifton, um, might you please uh, uh, tell us something more about the uh, fellowship program with Bulgari? and uh, how is uh, the research is proceeding for, for, for in respect of this research? Yes, thank you. So as I mentioned, uh, we have 75 women at Rockefeller who are actively engaged in uh, the 25 laboratories that are conducting uh, research on COVID-19. Uh, and the Bulgari uh, Fellowship Program will support nine of these uh, graduate students and postdoctoral fellows uh, to pursue their research careers. Uh, and this support is uh, very critical. Uh, as uh, Jean-Christophe uh, mentioned, uh, it's, uh, 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 the period of training is a critical period for people to demonstrate their ability uh, to develop a career theme that enables them to go forward and obtain an independent uh, career position uh, as a faculty mm -hmm. member in an institution or to move to uh, uh, industry or other venues. Uh, and uh, we've been strong supporters of uh, women in science, as uh, mentioned, this program, our women in science program has existed since 1997. We also give one of the most prestigious uh, awards uh, for women in science, uh, the uh, uh, Green Guard Prize for Women in Science, which was uh, established uh, in 2001 with the proceeds that uh, one of our faculty, Paul Greengard, won the Nobel Prize and contributed uh, his winnings from the prize uh, to the support of women in science and the recognition uh, with this uh, uh, prize for outstanding achievements by women in science. So uh, this fellowship program uh, uh, from Bulgari will uh, continue this tradition and enable uh, women uh, to pursue their careers and provide the critical support uh, for making advances. As I mentioned in uh, my brief presentation, uh, you know, one of our uh, women in science in COVID-19 is Marina Kasky, uh, who is a very distinguished uh, woman in science now who uh, is leading the clinical, led the clinical trials for the development of uh, antibodies that uh, can prevent and uh, uh, protect people from uh, HIV infection. Uh, and she and uh, Michelle Nussenzweig pivoted uh, quickly to tackle COVID-19. Uh, and have these antibodies that are now entering clinical trials that they identified from patients who had recovered from infection with COVID-19 uh, from the first cases uh, that uh, had the virus uh, in the New York region. Uh, and uh, this has been a very exciting uh, uh, program, but it's simply one example. There are uh, many others that uh, range across the uh, diagnostic and therapeutic landscape. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, we uh, can also um, treat now our third topics and then pass to the to the Q and A uh, of today, which is particularly the, um, the the patronage. And I would like that Jean Christophe Babin, uh, please uh, will explain us the importance of Bulgari facing uh, the history of Rome, the roots of the brand. Uh, Bulgari has managed so many projects and he has also, also introduced at the beginning of our conversation the most important ones and um, starting from the last one, not for importance, the Fondazione Torlonia and to talk about also uh, the, the Spanish steps and the, uh, the Caracalla baths and, and also Save Venice. Can I ask Jean-Christophe to, to introduce us these important topics we would like to, to talk about? Yeah, thank you, Eleonora, and thank you, uh, Richard and uh, Yanti. Uh, just one point I think it's, uh, I wanted to add on several children. It's uh, probably one of the closest collaboration ever, I mean, with a pride company, uh, a rather medium size. I mean, we are uh, a leader in eye jewelry worldwide. Uh, on the other end, we are not a size necessarily of dot-com uh, companies. So I think it's a pretty uh, incredible example, I mean, of total trust. Uh, this agreement was initially a serious agreement. It has been reconnected several times very uh, seamlessly, I would say. And uh, really, we built together not only education for more than 2 million kids, we raised uh, more than $100 million. So it's something which, again, I mean, in the history of private companies is pretty unique. And this has really enabled, I mean, to create uh, those amazing programs, uh, besides obviously some disaster reliefs, which we, we have been supporting in IT in Nepal, for instance, but also those education programs with the kids first and then the first job, and then ultimately, I mean, uh, the art, uh, arts is really uh, the DNA of Bulgaria. Bulgaria wouldn't be, I mean, uh, the magnificent Roman eye jeweler and one of the world leaders in jewelry if we're not from Rome. Rome is uh, dominating the artistic scene from now uh, more than 20 centuries. Uh, it's probably unique in its kind that any period of mankind history, Rome has been a protagonist. Uh, it was true, I mean, uh, at the times of the Republic, it was true uh, when Christ was born, it was true uh, in the Ascimento, uh, Renaissance, as much as in Baroque and more recently, uh, we have examples in Rome of very uh, 21st century modern architecture, including the cloud, which is an amazing building in the heart of the city. So Rome really uh, has been a very inspiring source for the art of Bulgaria and part of our success has been really driven by this amazing, unique uh, surrounding worldwide of those many uh, thousand years of architecture, uh, which have given birth to uh, equally eternal jewels. And that's why, I mean, very early, the Bulgarian family has been very keen uh, to support the city, to support the Minister of Culture of Italy, into the gigantic task to keep that city, you know, well run. Let's not forget, it's a small city. We talk about uh, a bit over 2 million people who are sitting on the richest treasure on the planet. And obviously, uh, taxes are not enough uh, to maintain that treasure, to develop it. And that's why Bulgaria, but also, thanks God, also, uh, other Italian private companies uh, have been really uh, trying to help as much as possible uh, the cultural ministry, uh, the uh, city of Rome, uh, to really uh, maintain and restore that city to its former grandeur. Uh, one of the first projects has been, uh, obviously, uh, the Spanish steps. It dates back from uh, the Baroque period. Uh, and then we have done also a lot in antique times, uh, with Caracalla mosaics, which has given birth also to Diva, which is one of our most famous as well. And more recently, as you mentioned, Eleonora, the Tolonia marble. Uh, this marble collection is unique in the world, I think, for people who know art. Uh, it's totally unique for two reasons. It's the only collection existing portraying all Roman emperors over four centuries. Not only, but back, I mean, to gender equality, also very often the wife. And it's very rare in antique art to have couples sculptured. Uh, and this collection uh, has more than 1,000 marble pieces portraying all the emperors across four centuries, and there have been many, uh, together often with the wife. And the second incredible story about the Torlonia marble collection is that, believe it or not, this collection has been fully private has been patiently put together, I mean, for a few generations by the Torlonia family. It was a very 
uh, rich family from Rome and never ever disclosed to any public except I mean, the very close friends and relatives of the Tolmena family. So what this, uh, Bulgaria decided uh, three years ago was really to, to help the family, uh, to help also the city of Rome to bring uh, that collection to its former splendor because over the centuries of UC, the marble had been a bit damaged and also to make sure that the, the public would discover it because we believe very much in art, uh, in culture and likes of the children. We believe that uh, making arts public, making people with familiar with arts somehow contributes uh, to make human beings, real human beings. You know, art is the kind of ultimate expression of the human soul, of the human emotion, of the human skills. And therefore, for us, it was very important that not only the collection would be great and restored, but would be public. And then we picked together with uh, Alexander Tolonia, I mean, the, um, the family member who really uh, took the initiative uh, to, to do that together with us, uh, the 100 best pieces, which have been patiently restored manually, I mean, uh, over three years, uh, which eventually would be displayed uh, at Musei Capitolani. This is one of the Rome most famous museums, standing where uh, the Jupiter Temple was first erected, I mean, uh, in the fourth century uh, before Christ. So location which has seen for 2,400 years uh, the world history unfolding, and it would start in uh, October, COVID permitting, obviously, and uh, will be exhibited for uh, one year uh, before, and this is what's becoming even more interesting, it will go to other museums across the planet, a bit like Tutankhamon did, I mean, when this fabulous Egyptian treasure was disclosed a long time ago now. And uh, within those museums, but I cannot disclose yet the name, we have obviously an American museum. Uh, so thanks to the Tolonia family, thanks to Bulgari, we'll be able to disclose to a, a global public the most amazing and impressive uh, imperial uh, marble collection ever put together. And I think that uh, for Bulgari, you know, it just makes me happy because uh, obviously uh, crafting beautiful jewelry, amazing watches rather than a beautiful laser goes is an accomplishment. But I think I and all my 7,000 people, we find uh, an even greater sense of purpose uh, of somehow you know, investing uh, the lack, the, the trust we've got from our clients into uh, somehow contributing to the diffusion of arts, uh, especially those who have been hidden uh, for centuries. Yeah, it's totally true, Jean Christophe. In fact, these three topics uh, so the science and so the, uh, the research, together with scholarship and the, um, the restoration of beauty, are all three aspects that save human beings, especially in this period after COVID, during COVID. There's been something that everybody needs. So thank you for that, because Bulgaria, in fact, has testimony, the, uh, the big importance to restore and to uh, restitute, also restitution to the beauty. What it is the inspiration for jewelry, the magnificent pieces that uh, the company uh, has uh, produced during these years and nowadays. And um, this is the particular re relationship, Jean-Christophe, with the town of Rome, the eternal town. What about uh, the special relationship, that especially the, the Americans, the North American, um, um, the Bulgarian North America has supported since years. So I refer to the uh, Save Venice, so the, the leading um, uh, uh, organization dedicated to, the, to preserve the artistic heritage of Venice, because this is something that uh, come from another world, another world of beauty, and Bulgaria, indeed, also in this field, will say something. Well, uh, first, I want to thank, I mean, all the uh, Seb Venice uh, members and founders, because uh, indeed, I mean, together with Rome, probably Venice uh, is a richest city when it comes to artistic density. Uh, rich and also very much better, as you know, it's uh, built uh, on the Laguna. Uh, which by definition is not the best environment for buildings to, to stay forever. Uh, and with those buildings, uh, you have treasures which can be frescoes, which again are not necessarily the best friends of humidity and water. And therefore this American initiative, because it's all came from America, has been for the city of Venice. And I think for the, the world of art, 
uh, a huge, huge uh, support and help to, to really contribute, I mean, to, to, to make that city survive. Because when we talk about Rome, I mean, Rome has never really been threatened as such. Uh, its architecture, obviously, has been damaged by wars, by change of power, but at the end of the day, I mean, no natural disaster ever uh, threatened the city of Rome. Uh, conversely, Venice, just because it's built on a very unexpected, uh, unusual uh, location for a city, I mean, usually you have only fishers' villages on Lagunas, but here it's a world city, which has a combination hosted more than 500,000 people all over the water. Uh, this heritage has been really totally shredded, and I think thanks to St. Venice, uh, which has aided a lot to, uh, obviously, uh, the state support to the city, uh, the UNESCO, Venice is a world heritage city. Um, obviously, uh, this has contributed usually uh, to, to make Venice what it is today, uh, that a city which is still alive, a city uh, where most buildings have been stabilized because many were uh, risking to just to collapse. Uh, and uh, really, uh, I will never thank enough, I mean, uh, America, uh, which really has saved in Venice. Yeah, so thank you. Um, before coming to the uh, Q&A, I would like to, to uh, ask to the three um, some questions. Uh, to come back to Yanti, uh, would like to that you specify what else in Save the Children did or is doing right now for children uh, in need of COVID. Can you explain also in relationship with our uh, Arte di Bulgari? Sure, as you can imagine, Save the Children globally, you know, we work in, in over a hundred countries. We had to completely adapt what we do for children uh, because there was literally not one single site unaffected by, by this pandemic. Now, in, in the, I would say in almost all of those instances, our, our work has continued. Of course, we had to adapt. So learning is happening remotely. Sometimes that's online, but quite often it's actually very low tech uh, channels that we're using. We're using radio, national TV broadcasts. We're using churches and mosques to broadcast education messages or messages for uh, around protection and also basic hygiene, what communities can do to prepare and, and prevent uh, COVID from, from taking a foothold. Uh, we're working with our, our hospitals uh, and, and medical clinics to, uh, to, to, to help children in particular and their families. And in some of the large, in the world's largest refugee camps, we're also running isolation uh, and treatment centers uh, where that is necessary. Because of course, in, a, in highly densely populated areas, we are incredibly concerned about what could happen once the, once the virus runs rampant there. So we've been doing a lot around, uh, not just in the United States, where we, yes, we have been delivering meals uh, to, to families at home, um, but across the world, we've, we've had to adapt. And in, in a lot of cases, we've gone back to even uh, in-person, uh, delivering of services, uh, and, but in a number of areas we're doing so remotely and of course, you know, we're, we're keeping our staff uh, as, as safe as we can by, by you know, help, helping them with uh, protective equipment uh, and, and, and special measures to, to maintain uh, safe distancing where that is required. Yeah, sure, sure, Yanti. Can you briefly uh, give us some uh, uh, feedback of other countries where uh, you are, uh, in fact, uh, acting in, the, uh, in this period, uh, so other than U.S.? Other than U.S.? Sure. Um, just to, you know, we, we, as I said, we work in over 100 countries, and, you know, Bulgari has been one of our, you know, most fantastic, I would say, corporate partnerships to help us over the past 11 years, working in, in 35, in over 35, I think, of those 100 countries. Um, you know, the example I gave uh, about using churches for broadcasting or national TV or radio in, in, is particularly effective in, in Africa. In, in Ethiopia, we've done a, a national agreement with the, with the largest churches organizations to make sure that, you know, across their uh, uh, communities, they, they reach out around um, uh, prevention and, and basic hygiene uh, measures or helping communities to understand what it means to do uh, to properly wash their hands, to distance themselves, what to do with when family members get sick, uh, etc. So um, in 
the isolation and treatment centers we've been setting up in, uh, in Cox's Bazar, which is the world's largest refugee settlement with almost a million people, uh, of which there are 600,000 children uh, in, in, a, in a very small area. Um, and in a number of countries in Africa, we're also helping uh, hospitals run uh, specific treatment centers or, or isolation centers. So I would say that there is there are very little, there's very few aspects of our work that are not impacted by, by this pandemic. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you, Jantje. Thank you. Um, I would like, again, Dr. Lifton, if I could uh, ask something. Uh, can you talk, Dr. Lifton, uh, a, bit, a little bit more about the, the women and science progress specifically. You mentioned that it was used as a framework, as a model, okay? Uh, used also by other universities um, around the world. Can you do some examples? For instance, uh, Jean-Christophe Amon mentioned our also partnership with Oxford. Did you have also some, some points together with them? Yes. Well, so scientific enterprise is, uh, is really global, and particularly in the context of this pandemic, I think it's been quite striking how many of the barriers to collaboration uh, across both inter institutional boundaries and across international boundaries uh, have really come down. And the collective response of the scientific community, I think there's uh, little doubt uh, that the scientific community has seen this uh, pandemic as one of the tests for science. Uh, you know, we have uh, said for so long uh, that uh, knowledge is uh, key to uh, uh, preventing disease and uh, being able to treat it. And uh, this pandemic is a good example of that. So I think in the, uh, in the current pandemic, it has been quite striking how rapidly uh, different aspects of the scientific community as well as industry have come together to try to accelerate the rate of development of diagnostics, vaccines, therapeutic agents. And so the collaborations have been uh, uh, quite remarkable. So when uh, we began discussions uh, uh, with uh, Bulgari, uh, we were quite uh, impressed and delighted to hear of uh, your, your collaboration developing with Oxford as well. Uh, Oxford is a, a great, uh, uh, one of the great world universities, and uh, they have a very uh, distinguished and accomplished group in development of vaccines at the Jenner Institute that uh, your support, helping to support. And uh, our work uh, is quite complementary with uh, uh, what uh, the Jenner Institute is doing. So for example, um, Vaccines are very effective and are likely to be effective for many in the population. But in some cases, uh, people in the, uh, particularly among the elderly or people who have uh, suppression of their immune systems, vaccines may not uh, be beneficial. Well, these are exactly uh, the opportunities in which these antibodies that are being developed at Rockefeller are likely to be effective. Uh, if you can uh, identify people who are unlikely to develop an effective immune response and still protect them from infection by giving them the antibodies that their immune system would normally be producing in response to the virus and protect them. So this is, uh, I think, an example of uh, complementarity across scientific fields, but there really has been uh, quite unprecedented uh, removal of barriers to the sharing of information uh, across institutions. I think uh, the world scientific community uh, recognizes the extraordinary importance of uh, to, uh, as rapidly as possible moving science uh, to develop new approaches to prevention, uh, diagnosis, and therapeutics. Uh, and I think we see this uh, every day. And uh, I think uh, you know we're, we're just so incredibly grateful to Bulgari for their commitment to uh, the Women in Science uh, program that uh, is advancing our efforts here at Rockefeller. Thank you, Richard, uh, Richard, before we move to the Q&A, obviously, as you can imagine, uh, beyond being CEO of Bulgari, you know, I'm just a man. And, uh, and like anyone on the planet, I'm just uh, curious, eager, and anxious somehow to understand with all your works, all your research, uh, the Oxford researches, but as you mentioned, I mean, this kind of global effort made by scientific community to eradicate uh, COVID uh, from testing early, 
earlier than before, rather than curing or preventing, when can we uh, expect, I mean, a uh, quick test, which you can do from home, uh, rather than uh, some medicine, which can cure you if ever you get sick, and obviously a vaccination to prevent you gonna get it, because I think this is really the major question now that uh, 8 billion citizens of the planet have in mind, and looking at you, I cannot not ask you that question. Yes, so I think you've uh, hit on the key aspects. So among the things that we know about viral infections are that if you're going to try to treat an infection, uh, you need to treat it early. And so you need tests that are broadly available when as soon as people become symptomatic, they can get a test and get diagnosed immediately, not have to wait three to five days or in some cases a week to get results. Uh, we know from influenza and others that if you start specific therapy within the first couple of days, you can drastically attenuate the, the, the course of the infection and prevent the worst outcomes. So we need that ability. Uh, there are a number of testing uh, strategies that uh, are coming uh, forward that have the potential, not uh, there yet, but have the potential for uh, inexpensive home testing. So that as soon as you become symptomatic, uh, you could apply a test at home and find out whether you have the infection. And if you do, uh, get treated immediately with uh, an effective therapy. So that's the testing side. The, the therapeutic oh, side- without, without, Is it a bit like the pregnancy test? Something you can easily do without any kind of assistance? Yes, so right now, uh, there have just in the last uh, several weeks, uh, two uh, large diagnostic companies, uh, Abbott and Roche, have released uh, tests analogous, as you said, uh, to home pregnancy tests. However, the reagents that are needed at present uh, are, only as, are only trusted to be to the care of uh, a physician's office, for example. So it's not ready to be a home test. You need much more stable reagents uh, that you can you know, buy at your local drugstore or take home and have sitting in a drawer ready to go when uh, the need arises. So until we have that, we won't have uh, a home testing widely available, uh, but uh, I'm hopeful that this will be coming in the, in the coming months. But the wow. testing uh, bottleneck is getting uh, uh, much, mu much more open with these uh, pregnancy-like uh, tests uh, rapidly becoming available uh, in the millions. So there will be uh, tens of millions of these tests available. The challenge will be getting them distributed widely enough uh, for people to be able to go to a healthcare provider and get these tests uh, rapidly. They only take about 15 minutes uh, to administer and analyze. Uh, so this is a, a big advance on the testing side for sure. Yeah, it's all very interesting. And, and on, the, on the curative side and the preventive side? Yes, so the vaccine, uh, as, as you know, there are uh, over 100 companies that uh, are attempting to develop uh, vaccines. Uh, there's been a major response by the biotech and uh, pharmaceutical industry. There are uh, at least five that are, are well into clinical development and are likely to report out uh, results uh, sometime uh, later this fall. Uh, it, is, it is possible that uh, there may be a sufficient signal to demonstrate efficacy and safety before the complete phase three trial has been uh, completed. As you know, these phase three trials typically have 30,000 people uh, involved in randomized testing, looking at people who do and do not get uh, the vaccine in the same environment and see whether uh, the people who get the vaccine are protected relative to the people who did not. Uh, and this both gives you insight you into whether the test is effective. And, uh, I'm sorry? Uh, both oh, whether go, the go, on, go, on, go on, please. It's, it's, it's very important. Hello. Richard? Hello. Yeah, Richard, proceed. Yeah, so, you just said that, so that, I mean, uh, yeah, on vaccination, a... is, Laura, please. On vaccination, it will come soon. And on curative? Yes, and on the, on the therapeutic, uh, we, still, we still have uh, limited ability Can in the therapeutic have... space for development of new uh, treatments. 
Uh, but uh, these are also in development for highly specific uh, drugs that will specific, be specific uh, for the virus itself uh, and should be efficacious. But these are still on the horizon and we don't have uh, early uh, drugs uh, that are highly efficacious as yet. Well, Leonora, maybe we can move to the q and if you have some questions already. Hello, Nora. Yeah, I had some problem with the temporarily with the lines. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. perfect. So can we move yeah. to the Q&A if you have some questions already? Yeah, yeah, because it is, I would like to say, in fact, when you are discussing a very important point, that I received a very interesting question for Jean-Christophe. Um, and that is, once there is a vaccine or cure for COVID, is the antivirus work something you intend to continue? So, as, as I mentioned, you know, the, uh, the Bulgari virus refound is not meant only, I mean, to, to support uh, the scientific war against COVID-19. But beyond COVID-19, we all know that, uh, unfortunately, there, there will probably be new viruses coming. I mean, there has been SARS, there has been MERS, now we have COVID-19, as I mentioned earlier, probably one day there will be COVID-25 or whatever. And I think that a bit like in antibiotics, uh, when amoxicillin uh, was developed, uh, the dream of Bulgaria, but obviously uh, not sure it's fully compatible with sciences, would be to have a kind of universal platform or module on which you could probably uh, evolve a specific uh, new virus, uh, but something which could cut a lot uh, the research development times, so having already a kind of universal base uh, on which a new uh, vaccination or cure could be uh, quicker and easier adapted. So I don't know, Richard, whether this kind of dream, which is paralleling the antibiotics, could be one day possible in the field of viruses. Yes, I think that's a very important and interesting uh, point you make. Uh, we have done this to a certain extent with influenza virus, where every year we anticipate uh, what strain of virus is likely to be predominant in the coming year. So we begin developing uh, the vaccine for the next year very early, so that there's an adequate supply by the time uh, the influenza season arrives. As you said, in the last 20 years, three different coronaviruses have transferred from animals to people to cause outbreaks uh, uh, like this current pandemic. And I think you're correct in your insight that uh, this will not be the last one. So I think we need the better uh, global effort to anticipate what the next viruses are likely to be and begin thinking about how to develop uh, the platforms uh, for development of rapid vaccines uh, when these continue to emerge. This does not mean, of course, that we shouldn't do more to prevent this uh, lateral transfer of virus from uh, animal species uh, to humans. Uh, the best approach ultimately is if we can prevent that from happening to begin with, but we do need to be prepared. Yeah, I think we have more time for one question for Jean-Christophe. Um, can you tell us more about what Bulgari and Save the Children are doing in Italy? Well, uh... In Italy, basically, we have uh, several different uh, collaboration, uh, like in any country which is struck by a disaster. For instance, when we had the earthquake close to Rome five years ago, we immediately uh, supported some children into uh, creating in the devastated area uh, some guitar gardens so that uh, the parents could be relieved temporarily uh, from the children care uh, to start, I mean, rebuilding, reconstructing, uh, going to the priorities, including insurances, some were dead or, or also badly injured. So uh, disaster relief remains even in a modern and developed country like it is, something that uh, we occasionally, unfortunately, uh, are doing. Uh, but generally speaking, in Italy, uh, there is also, like in any Western country, a lot of poverty still looming around. You know, those societies are very developed, very rich. On the other end, this is an average, and still a lot of people are somehow uh, isolated from the wealth. And uh, even close to Rome, there are some districts where uh, kids get uh, little education, even though it's mandatory officially. But this happens, I think, uh, in the United States, it happens in France, it happens in, in most countries. And therefore, we are dedicating a lot of resources also to, to help those children. Uh, last year, for instance, we added 
a new step in our cooperation with what we call uh, Punto Luce degli Arti. Punto Luce degli Arti is located 30 kilometers south of Rome in the city called Ostia. Ostia was the antique harbor of the imperial city of Rome. And in that city, uh, we have just uh, revamped uh, a public school, which was abandoned, into a center, an educational center for the kids, which is very much centered on developing their skills to become artists. So basically, it's very similar to the concept which has been initiated by Dante in the United States, in Houston, and then in California, whereby kids uh, after school, or if they don't go to school during the day, they come and join uh, a lot of courses which are uh, generously uh, given uh, by people who don't charge anything, uh, which can be about cinema, about photography, uh, about sculpture, about design, so that they develop, you know, first a taste uh, for art, and eventually an idea, obviously, uh, this is our vision, our dream, uh, to turn, I mean, those skills, this test for art, into an activity which will make them first full time and full-fledged members of our society and obviously allow them to make a living because uh, otherwise you know they can often fall unfortunately into further poverty which turns into delinquence and then into a life which no one is, is wishing to anyone so at the end of the day it's not so different from what we could do together with stc in a refugee camp in uh, in jordan where at the end of the day uh, we are financing a school or a kindergarten um, it's very really to bring education everywhere uh, kids, for whatever reason, whatever uh, their gender, whatever their origin, their religion, their culture, they just cannot get it uh, for uh, because of the overall environment. And Italy is one of those many Western countries where we we have to acknowledge that there is a lot to do as well for kids. Not it's not only uh, some poor countries in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America. It's very often, I mean, just next door to to offices. Okay, thank you to everybody for this interesting conversation. Thank you, I everyone. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Yankees. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Yankees, and team. Thank you. Thank you.